This is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris take office as president and vice president at noon tomorrow, and the expectations are unprecedented. The new president has to lead in a nation that is more divided than at any point since the Civil War. And as the nation faces a pandemic that has killed nearly 400,000 Americans and upended the economy. That includes a death toll that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates at nearly two times higher for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Washington is bracing for dozens of consequential executive actions that will start Wednesday and stretch over the first 10 days of Biden administration, as well as legislation that will begin working its way through Congress on pandemic relief, immigration, and much more. This will be a very different presidential inauguration. Instead of people jammed into the Washington Mall, there will be a field of flags on display, echoing the America United theme of Inauguration Week. The display features nearly 200,000 U.S. flags and 56 pillars of light. The pillars symbolize every U.S. state and territory, according to the Inauguration Committee. The display represents all Americans unable to travel to Washington, D.C. to attend the inauguration due to the coronavirus pandemic. The new administration is wasting no time reversing some of the more controversial decisions from the past four years. The incoming administration signaled Monday that it will end the United States backing of the Keystone XL pipeline. The Biden plan, reported by the Canadian Broadcasting Company, says the $8 billion pipeline no longer works in the era of climate change. The 1,200-mile structure was supposed to deliver tar sands oil from Alberta, Canada to the Midwest and eventually ports on the Gulf Coast. Tribes along that route have mostly been opposed to the project. Just this month, the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and the Fort Belknap Indian community filed a federal lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Interior for issuing a permit for the pipeline. The tribes say the Interior Department did not seek tribal consultation before greenlighting the project. Last week, another group, the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, said 75 indigenous women from tribes and nations across the country sent a letter to the incoming administration to stop Keystone XL on day one. It said, all of these pipelines are moving forward without the free, prior, and informed consent of indigenous tribes and nations, violating indigenous rights and further contributing to the destruction of sacred waters and lands and our global climate. Other projects that could see a review using climate change as a framework range from the Dakota Access Pipeline to the Bears Ears National Monument. A bill drafted in November would pave the way to create a process to rename Utah landmarks that are offensive to Native Americans. The bill is labeled Place Name Amendments, which outlines how to change names that are seen as discriminatory. The bill is sponsored by Democratic Senator Janie Iwamoto. The bill includes landmarks across Utah that have the word squaw in the name, which is considered a slur against Native American women. Utah currently has 56 landmarks identified with that offensive slur. The bill would be sent to legislation at the end of this month. An indigenous middle school in northern Wisconsin is launching its way into history. Thanks to the student spaceflight experiment, the Lakota Ray Ojibwe, or Lakota Ray Ojibwe School has been selected to be a part of the program and will be the first tribal school to participate. Their project, Fish Egg Development, used rainbow trout eggs as their test subjects and placed them in tubes that were given to astronauts to fly to the International Space Station. Once the space project returns, the students will look at the results of the experiment. The Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma is establishing its first hunting and fishing reserve. The reserves will be dedicated to Cherokee citizens for controlled hunting, which will open later this year. Cherokee Nation Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr introduced the act to the Cherokee Nation Council recently. Take a look at the map. The tribe has more than 4,000 acres of woodland in three counties, Sequoia, Craig, and Adair. They will also use the land to help with fighting COVID-19 and provide isolation to members who have been exposed. The land also offers an abundance of deer, squirrel, rabbit, turkey, dove, quail, waterfowl, and fish. The council is expected to approve the hunting area by the end of January. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahant.
It's National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. When we come back, we'll see how this issue is affecting Indian country. This month is National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month, as decreed by Presidential Proclamation. January is also known as Human Trafficking Awareness Month. This is an issue that severely impacts Indian country. Indigenous people are at a higher risk of human trafficking, according to the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. But one nonprofit is dedicated to helping others who are coming out of human trafficking. Maureen Loma Heptawa is a certified peer victim specialist at LifeLink. She has been working with the program for 10 years. She joins us now to talk about how this issue impacts families and what you can do to spot the warning signs. Welcome, Maureen. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Great to have you here. Why, why is this important issue so important to share and get the word out? Um, this issue is... Um, very important uh, due to the fact that it happens in our backyards today. Um, it happens with family members, with, you know, people you don't even know um, that are walking down the street. You don't know the situations that they may come across, um, especially with uh, children and young teens. Um, a lot of uh, the victims that we have worked with um, come from a lot of um, vulnerable homes, backgrounds, um, foster care system. And also, you know, it, it is within uh, the rich communities as well. Um, you just never know the type of situation that any one of us could walk into with human trafficking. Any person walking down the street, even myself to um, you as well, uh, we could be targets. And, you know, they, they do target a lot of vulnerable but it could happen to any one of us. So that's why it's so important to um, educate, learn and talk about human trafficking amongst um, each other and in your communities and worldwide. What, what's something that most people wouldn't know about human trafficking? The piece of it that a lot of people don't understand is that um, it happens a lot within homes. Um, a lot of children are trafficked by their own parents. Um, relatives, uncles, aunts. Um, a lot of people think um, human trafficking has a lot to do with the movies that are put out, um, but that's just all um, glamorized and it's not uh, realistic. And um, a lot of people don't understand how human trafficking become how how a victim becomes uh, a victim of trafficking. Um, there's a lot of of ways uh, of spotting someone who may be trafficked. Um, so yeah, that that's pretty much a lot of uh, what people don't understand. They think it only happens in other countries. They think that um, it can't happen to them or anyone that they know, but a lot of people don't understand that it's happening today in your own backyard. It could be happening in your community, down the street. It, it's happening everywhere. That's so sad, Maureen, when you think about it, the very people who are supposed to protect you may be involved with this. Uh, that, that just takes away almost uh, a lot of hope from a child. Yes, definitely. And, you know, they're, they're, they're the most um, targeted individuals is our children. 
So, you know, it's best to start educating early, especially at a young age. You want to start educating your children. I know you want to protect your children, but we have to have eyes for everything, especially now and today. You mentioned the idea of uh, looking for signs. What, what are some of those signs? Um, a lot of signs we pick up on is um, you look at a lot of individuals who are vulnerable. Um, you'll see peop- uh, women, sometimes men as well, children, um, they don't have a voice of their own. Uh, they're pretty much controlled. They have uh, no way, no identification of them on themselves. Um, they pretty much can't do things on their own. They're pretty much controlled. Uh, a lot of them, you know, will not never ask for help. They're, they're fearful, they're afraid. Um, so it's best to look for signs, look for signs that someone may need help. Even if uh, you see a woman or a man or someone who has experienced domestic violence, that's, that's uh, one vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability that uh, traffickers like to pick up on. So when they notice, um, if you notice someone who is heavy on drugs and needs help, um, you, those are pretty much signs that you can see. Um, and those are a lot of what the traffickers go for because they have more mind control. They have more control over the person. Um, they do a lot of controlling by um, getting people at the future drugs. So they come back to them. Um, but yeah, also just looking for a lot of the vulnerable people in the community, um, runaways, teenagers who run away from homes, they're, they're a huge target. Um, children who are coming out of the foster care system, they're a huge target. Um, yeah, and, and just people who have nobody, people who are alone in this world and don't have a support team or, uh, or family or friends, they're, they're most likely ones to become victims of human trafficking because they're easiest to disappear and nobody will know and nobody will be looking for them. So um, yeah, there's, there's so many signs. And if you do see signs, um, we just ask that you call the police. You know, it may not be um, a victim of human trafficking, but you're assisting someone within the community that could prevent someone from being trafficked in that community. We know the incidents are so high in Native American communities. And do you think there's a link between trafficking and missing and murdered indigenous women and girls? No, um, I think it's all, it comes together, you know, and also in Indian country, it is, I would say, yes, the the high rate of Native Americans missing in um, Native lands is, I definitely do do believe that it is, more likely to happen due to the isolation, due to of how um, vulnerable it is out there and um, how easy it is to try to um, get a victim off uh, the reservation. Um, it's not an easy place to live. Um, a lot of people, a lot of young kids, um, teenagers, young adults are looking for a way out. Um, so I, you know, and when, when Native Americans end up missing, there's really no great or 100% statistic that proves how much women and men we have lost throughout the Native American um, lands. Um, I just feel like there's really no, no um, perfect um, uh, calculation of what we, how many people have we lost men and women, and also children. What steps can somebody take who's been through this to get help and to be um, made safe? Uh, The steps, it's really, really hard um, for to tell a victim or someone who is being trafficked the steps to be safe because they don't even know the steps. Um, So that's why it's important to educate yourselves within the community and each other and in your workspace um, about how to be a voice for victims because a lot of them don't have a voice. A lot of them are living in fear and afraid and don't realize that there's help out there. So we have to be that voice. We have to be the ones to step up 
and um, learn about human trafficking, educate yourselves. There's so much information on the internet. Um, we do a lot of OVC trainings on human trafficking and it teaches you a lot on how to work with victims, what to look for and identify when um, seeing a victim of um, human trafficking. And also like taking classes, um, trainings. Um, I do support a lot of trauma-informed care um, because of the victims are so traumatized, severe with severe trauma, you want to be trauma informed when approaching. If you happen to come across a victim on how to approach them, how to talk to them, um, because a lot of them are, are scared and they're not going to say nothing to you. They're not going to open up to you because they, you know, they, they don't know. They don't know how to trust anyone, not even themselves. So um, it's, it's really it's 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 really hard. What do you hope to see for the future? Um, I would I the hope to see is like more communities, more organizations coming together to combat human trafficking, um, to come together with law enforcement, with um, legislation office on fighting the battle against human trafficking with harsher harsher law penalties. Um, victimization getting um the victims what they what they're entitled to from all the trauma that they've endured from traffickers um yeah it mainly just harsher penalties on traffickers who 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 are out there trafficking victims um just for all of us to come together to fight this the biggest battle that's happening in our land today you mentioned harsher penalties but it's not just a criminal justice issue it's also a social issue to get people. Yes, definitely. Um, and to get people to understand what human trafficking really is and how to combat it and fight it and how to be a voice for those out there that need a voice. Thank you, Maureen Lama Heptawa for joining us. You're very welcome, thank you. We'll be right back with a look at the huge security measures being taken in Washington, DC for the presidential inauguration tomorrow. It's a maze in Washington, D.C. Locals are reporting that it's taking twice as long to get to work, and it's not due to traffic, but rather the huge barriers that are now set up all around the Capitol and the White House. Our deputy managing editor, Jordan Bennett Begay, spent five hours navigating the massive security, and she takes us on her tour that started at 1 p.m. and ended as the sun went down around 6 p.m. In the days leading up to the inauguration of Joe Biden, the country's peaceful transition of power looks anything but peaceful. Here's what the massive security looks like. And this is the traffic getting into the district. Um, when the inauguration comes on Wednesday, this bridge will be closed down. So I have to park a few blocks away because there's no parking, of course, closer. And I have to walk. So it's barricaded on there. I just keep hearing DC residents when they're walking around saying, I guess we can go this way. I think they're kind of don't know which way they can walk. Because every road downtown is blocked. 
is blocked or has fences up so you can see well it's crazy getting here um it's kind of creepy there's nobody it's all gated huh. this is so this has been an adventure i had to go thank goodness uh my parents always told me police are your friends because i felt definitely safe here um with all the barricades and fences even though it's like a maze but everybody's been super helpful and just trying to, I mean, to get back to my car, um, and security's really tight, so, but everybody's super nice. You know, even though I say it feels safe, it still feels a little bit odd or creepy. Jordan joins us now. That was some tour. What else can you tell us about the preparations? Well, Mark, um, it was freezing, <laughs> and it's expected to be even colder tomorrow, so, I'm like wondering how, you know, we're all going to stay warm out there. Um, at for but fortunately, I don't know. We'll see how the wind goes. Um, well, and I guess like it took five hours just navigating because it was definitely a maze, as you said. Um, uh, there is barricades everywhere, everywhere that I would typically walk, um, you know, just on like a, you know, a summer day. But every time I was going to the sidewalk, I was met with fences. Um, there's only, you know, very few entrances, and even then, um, there are troops everywhere, there are secret service everywhere asking you questions, who you are, what your credentials are, um, and directing you, you know, toward the right path. Um, it was very, I think, it was very chilling just watching, walking in an area that was so populated by tourists and um, tour buses and just, you know, government officials and all that to become into a place that's so fenced in and barricaded and i think as a woman of color it was definitely a chilling and different experience although i did feel safe it felt very um just very intimidating <laughs> to be in all of that well, on social media you told the opposite story about uh, a woman of color in this new security climate oh <laughs> yeah well I, I think that's exactly it it's like exactly it so i remember i ran into um went to the security scanner and I was waiting to go through. And I remember I saw on the opposite side, this uh, white, you know, blonde hair reporter um, asking being his, um, asking for his jacket to be opened and empty his pockets again. And he was getting patted down and we made eye contact. And I was mentally preparing myself. Okay, this is what's going to happen. I understand it's, you know, the climate that's given right now, but I went through, gave him thumbs up, got my purse and things. And when I talked to the reporter, he asked, he's all, did you have any trouble getting in, you know, to the area we're at? I was like, no. He's all, well, I had a troop follow my car for three blocks and I, my jaw just dropped and I was like, wow, no, I didn't have any trouble. <laughs> and, and he's all, and he like flipped back his hair. He's like, well, I kind of fit the profile and it just took everything in me to not say welcome to my world or, you know, how it feels. And I just had so much compassion, but it was just, you know, the tables have turned in that moment and in this climate here in the Capitol. That's actually why I wanted to ask you about it. It's really a powerful moment in terms of just perception. I'm wondering now, I and mean, we're looking at uh, hearings coming up very soon for uh, Biden appointment uh, nominees. And with this new security world, is it going to make it tougher just to cover ordinary things in Washington? Um, I think it is. Um, I definitely, I mean, just being there um, yesterday, I did feel a little bit safer, but it is, take, it takes a lot of planning, you know, and a lot of planning, not only just what you're going to take, but also time and preparation ahead, who you're going to talk to, who you have to reach out to, um, and, you know, it's not going to be definitely nothing spontaneous like before. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of, you know, just covering Washington, that's just, it's going to, you know, be very similar. 
Jordan, we know the new administration is going to be issuing all sorts of executive orders ranging from the Keystone XL pipeline, backing away from it, to Bears Ears. Um, what does that look like for the for reporting in Washington? Well, I mean, as we already saw, Keystone pipeline, um, Biden is, you know, looks like he's going to reverse it. And I think that's what a lot of the decisions with this new administration, that's what they're going to be doing, right? When Trump came in, he immediately set into place um, passing Keystone, Dakota Access, Shrinking Bears Ears, like just very quickly. And now I think Biden coming in and possibly if um, Deb Holland is confirmed as the new interior secretary, all those decisions will probably be reversed immediately, um, probably within the first, they like said 10 days, who knows? Um, I think they're gonna try their best to, you know, keep on their, his climate um, change agenda. Yeah, it's interesting just to the idea of climate change as a framework, it's gonna be very different government. Thank you, Jordan Bennett Begay. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And that's our slice of the indigenous world today. Thank you for watching and we'll be back for another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.